Hello all. Uh, my name's Neil McDade. Middle name's Patrick. I was born in Redcliffe uh, in Queensland in uh, 13th of September 1955. Grew up uh, all over Queensland. My father was with the Commonwealth Bank, so we moved every three or four years. So I've lived in Mandubra, which is a huge metropolis out west of uh, Bundaberg, Ayr, Rockhampton, um, Clayfield, Toomble, all those sort of places, so all around Queensland. Um, a lot of fun in Namble. We lived in Namble for a while, so I got to go surfing every weekend. But uh, over that period of time, I virtually learnt to read by reading those little commando war comics. As I got older, I joined Scouts, uh, was right into scouting. Um, sort of grew out of that into school cadets. So I joined cadets in Rockhampton. I was in Scouts and cadets, so that was pretty full on. I just couldn't keep it up. So when we moved to um, Brisbane, I pulled out of Scouts and stayed with cadets. So I was with cadets a few years. Uh, we talked a lot to regular soldiers as second and third and fourth year cadets. You had a lot more to do with the supporting staff. And these were the people who were coming back from Vietnam uh, at that stage. Uh, they'd had some real life experience. So if you weren't a hippie and throwing tomatoes at Vietnam vets, you were on the other side and um, quite supportive uh, of our troops. Uh, I always wanted to join the army. When I finished school, my mother, and I did year 12 by the way, uh, when uh, I did finish school, my mother convinced me that I wouldn't like to be a soldier and I really should try something else. So I did things like I was a drainless labourer, I was a ship foreman in a meal factory, making peanut oil and linseed, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and honestly, there was just so many people telling me what to do all the time. I thought, bugger it, I'll join the regular army and let professionals tell me what to do. So I uh, joined the regular army in 74, late 74, did Kapuka, uh, had the Christmas break, my first serious accident, driving back from uh, Brisbane to Kapuka, rolled the car, had to finish the trip to Kapuka with my windscreen taped on and blood popping out the top of my head. But back in those days, you didn't want to be late. So I you know, got back there, got some free medical and dental at the Kapuka Hospital. Um, finished Kapuka, got selected for Armoured Corps. I actually wanted to be engineers or infantry or artillery. Armoured Corps was my first cho fourth choice. Um, my troop, my platoon officer back then was Armoured Corps and he said, you'll enjoy it a lot more than the others. So I went to, uh, went to Puckapunyal, uh, stayed there for quite a while. Um, back then the courses were slow in coming. Um, we had to wait to get a, enough people to make a course worthwhile. So I had a lot of experience mowing lawns, being barman in the sergeant's mess, things like that. But again, um, that was good experience because you talked a lot to experienced soldiers. Uh, you gained a lot of insight into what your life was going to be like in the regular army. And by the time you did the course, after being barman in the sergeant's mess forever, um, you knew all the instructors so they could pick on you even better than all the other students. Uh, finished Kapuka as a driver signaller, got uh, posted to the 2nd Cavalry Regiment in Holsworthy in Sydney. They were there at that time. Holsworthy was quite a big base, had a uh, great close training area. You could actually shoot uh, all, all our weapons, including artillery pieces and things like that at that time at Holsworthy. And uh, it was a great little barracks. Um, the sad side of it was that you were next to Liverpool. It was an hour's drive to go and have a drink in uh, Sydney, things like that. Um, it wasn't great. Uh, the social life was a bit hard, but uh, it wasn't a bad place to be posted. Um, it was an old base, and um, things were very interesting. Now, I became an assault trooper there. An assault trooper, just to fill people in, uh, is still a, a cavalry crewman. You do the cavalry crewman courses, but you also do uh, more the infantry style of things. So if you can imagine uh, an assault trooper is the guy who's with the cavalry troop, but they jump out and they do all the on-the-ground stuff, you know, prodding for mines, clearing obstacles, things like that. 
then the vehicles come through that were supporting you and they pick you up and you move on to the next task. Um, in barracks, uh, you do help with the vehicles, but you also do a lot of the more infantry style training. You use a lot of uh, various types of weapons. So it was an interesting uh, and fruitful little career. Um, in 1977, uh, they did ask who amongst the assault troopers wanted to go uh, and do a bit of extra infantry work. Uh, I put my hand up, a lot of people yelled out that I was a bit dumb, but it turned out the extra infantry work was to go to Air Base Butterworth in Malaysia with uh, one of the companies from 3RAR. Um, we went over there and we were actually acting as an infantry uh, soldier embedded in an infantry platoon as part of the uh, company that was protecting Air Base Butterworth. The primary role back then for uh, the Air Base Butterworth company was the protection of the assets, the Australian assets and the Australian families of the RAF uh, contingent that was manning Air Base Butterworth. Later on, Air Base Butterworth, after the mid 80s, uh, was more and more handed back to the Malays. Uh, there's still uh, an Australian contingent over there. There's still a uh, rifle company rotating through, but the uh, threats and the style of training and the requirements of the job have changed uh, remarkably from uh, the 70s through the mid 80s and then into the 90s where it is in this day more of a, a training opportunity. Uh, they're still there in case they're needed but uh, in this day and age it's much more a training opportunity and a chance to uh, exchange cultural views and, and uh, the ability to train with another force. But in the 70s, uh, they were serious about it. Uh, we got briefs on the communist threat. Uh, we got told about incidents that were happening uh, around the border and in neighboring um, countries at the time, uh, how uh, there was still the legacy of Vietnam. Vietnam had finished a couple of years earlier. Uh, there was the Pol Pot regime. There was all these things going on. There was border unrest between countries. Uh, there was countries who were still having trouble uh, with the communist forces that had taken over Vietnam. So there was a lot of um, uh, different messages being sent in, in the briefings we got before we went. We still had to go to Canungra, uh, like the people who uh, went to Vietnam and that, we did Canungra. We went over. The company I was with was fortunate enough to do a training exercise with 12 Royal Malay Regiment. So we were actually down the southern part of Malaysia for a while. Uh, we did about six weeks down there, running through the jungle and uh, getting strange exotic diseases. And then we went up and we did our term uh, at Butterworth. And that was uh, each platoon rotated through what's called the Quick Reaction Force, QRF. So back in those days, the QRF, one section slept in a ready room uh, with their weapons, with the truck outside, ready to go with a spotlight on it, big box full of ammo, um, uh, radios, a call out procedure and all that. So uh, they were told you will get training activities where you will be called out, um, but if the real thing happens, it's gonna be just like one of the training activities. And when you go, it'll be verified. And that's when um, you take the tape off your magazine and put the real bullets in. So. Uh, we were there uh, going through that. Uh, the other sections within that platoon that was on duty, uh, one would be on immediate standby, so you had to stay in your room over in the quarters, which wasn't far away. And then uh, the third section was allowed to do things like go to the shop, uh, go to the movies. But if the QRF got called out, the ready section uh, went over from the quarters and uh, took their place in the QRF room in case there was a second call out and um, the third section got called back from the pitches or whatever to become the ready waiting section. So uh, this was quite serious. The, the other two platoons, one would be doing training, another would be on, on a couple of days rest. So you actually had um, quite uh, serious commitment while you're over there. Now. Um, it was uh, unlike anything 
we'd done before. A lot of the uh, junior soldiers back then, um, the, the post-Vietnam era uh, ones, like myself, who joined, um, uh, this was one of the great opportunities to, to get away and to actually uh, go overseas. Um, it was one of the serious ones. A lot of people uh, tried to play it down. They didn't want to um, stir up uh, memories of the first Malaysian emergency, uh, which was a very serious uh, period for Australia. Um, we, we had some uh, big commitments in the first Malaysian emergency. Uh, a lot of people um, put their lives on the line there. Um, there were some quite heroic things done. That emergency situation carried on to a lesser extent right through until probably the mid 80s. Um, but in, in the 70s, uh, as well as that legacy from the Malaysian emergency and the communist terrorist threat, etc., in Latin in Malaysia, you also had the legacy of Vietnam and the surrounding countries, the Vietnamese War, and what had happened in Laos, Cambodia, etc., and all that. So there was still uh, that element of, of uh, danger. Um, it was uh, played down a little by the politicians. It was played up a bit by the int people giving us our briefs and that, because they didn't want us to relax. They said, you know, like, we're hoping nothing's going to happen. We're hoping there'll be no threat to the RAF families. We're hoping, but just be aware that there is a threat. And, and the biggest danger is thinking that Southeast Asia is now quiet, because it wasn't. Um, that trip was a, a bit of an eye-opener. Um, did a lot of infantry training, which stood me in good stead later on uh, with, with my job as an assault trooper. Made a lot of friends with the infantry. Um, almost learned how to play the bagpipes, but everybody told me I had to stop, because um, we had a bagpiper with our mob. And then uh, uh, I went back to a relatively ordinary life uh, at the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. But I, I just want to emphasise that that period, that uh, five and a half, six months that we were over there, um, there was the element all the way through it that uh, at any time, an emergency could erupt, you could be required to do your thing. We trained for that. Uh, we did a lot of things that uh, perhaps uh, may have been considered unnecessary, but that's only in hindsight. At the time, we thought uh, we were there doing the real thing for the, for the right reason, and according to our briefings, that's what was going on. Now, we uh, had a, a number of incidents that, that while I was there, at one time we um, went out there, we used to do uh, vehicle pickets and, and vital asset protections and things like that uh, around the, the airfield. Uh, there was times when you had to go and lie outside in ambush positions in uh, the rice paddy fields outside the, the wire at the back uh, at night. There was a command centre at the back, a uh, multinational command centre. Um, one time we were over there doing a, a vital asset protection role and this big limousine came out of there. And uh, the infantry people doing the right thing um, uh, stopped the vehicle, asked to see the people's ID, and for some reason both the driver and the passenger didn't have their ID with them. So next minute uh, they're out there leaning on the side of the car, machine guns pointed at them, uh, people are searching them and all that. The driver had the nous to make a quick phone call, they actually had one of those early car phone things, and next minute the base commander, the Malaysian base commander came racing over with all his entourage and going, no, 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 this is, this is the boss, this is your boss, this is your boss, Air Commodore, Air Commodore. So we're there, huh, so you can vouch for this gentleman. They said, yeah, he's commander of um, big headquarters. And he's there, I told you so, so you know, he said, oh, thanks very much, sir. Did the old, um, sorry about that, gave him a salute. Um, he got in his car and, and went off. And we actually got uh, what would, you'd call a, a congratulations, because he said, you know, it's good to see that you actually did the right thing. I should have had my ID. I didn't, my driver should have had his ID. He didn't. Um, you actually did the right thing. It was just a little bit embarrassing for me. 
the, the fortunate thing was back in those days we didn't all have an iPhone, otherwise his picture of leaning up against the limo would have been all around the world. Um, so those sort of things happened, you know, we had guys, we had to go out and protect the wire at night with a, a baseball bat or a, or a pick handle and a, a radio while our backup was over in the QRF hut 10 or 15 minutes away and we used to get people sneak over the wire and things like that and you had to go and grab them. Fortunately for us, they always turned out to be Malaysian pilots sneaking back in after a night out or something like that. So we didn't actually have any real incidents. Um, I did grab uh, a gun runner out the front. Um, he got hung later uh, down south, those sort of things. But um, fortunately for us, uh, we didn't have any real emergencies. We did our QRFs. Um, we had a couple of incidents where um, the Malays thought that was real and the next minute we had them with their real bullets pointing their guns up our noses while we pointed our guns with the real bullets up their noses. Um, but those situations were always diffused. Um, we had some great uh, opportunities to actually mix with them and, uh, you know, eating, eating a, a, you know, just living a, a different lifestyle. And yes, we did have uh, the odd day off where we managed to get over to Penang. Penang was a wonderful place to visit. Uh, we had a little uh, a one-week holiday where they let us get on the train and go up to Bangkok and come back again. So going through the border back in those days was an amazing experience. People getting hurled into razor wire and beaten up by the guards and all that. So we kept our mouths shut, sat in our little carriage, stared out the window with big round eyes and uh, they came through and checked us all out. Once they found we were uh, Australian Army and from Air Base Butterworth, uh, they gave us food and sat and chatted with us, but the other people on the train certainly were not as lucky. Uh, so even that was an experience. And, and coming back, uh, we all got searched, pulled apart and everything because they were always worried about people bringing guns back from Thailand into Malaysia. So we weren't spared anything then. The Malays tore us apart. Uh, because they thought we were probably more likely than anybody to want to bring our own gun back. But nothing happened. Uh, we all got through. We all survived. Uh, a few people got malaria, a few people got dysentery, a few people did things. We did uh, anti-pirate patrols on Langkawi Island. We got to fly in an old DC-3 with the rivets popping out and hitting us in the head um, and landed there. Um, so every platoon rotated through, did any pirate patrols. Um, you know, that was the first time I, I ever saw a leper. Got getting grabbed by a leper in the middle of some strange little islands, uh, uh, an eye an eye opening experience in itself. Running around for the next two or three weeks, asking all the medics if how how catching is leprosy. Um, so all those sort of things. So you know that that whole trip was a real maturing experience for a young soldier. Went back to Australia, that my next uh, great trip in amongst some other courses and some shitty uh, exercises was uh, my squadron rotated through Canada. Uh, we did some training in Canada, we did uh, glacering, cold, cold weather courses, uh, the assault troopers did mountain climbing, things like that. And uh, we went uh, along uh, with them, uh, they, they exchanged a squadron with us and uh, the only thing they could say was how the hell do you people live in such a hot place, you know, and that was Sydney. So uh, we got to go and try and dig holes in the permafrost at Camp Wainwright and all those sort of neat things. Uh, when we came back, uh, we put that down as another great experience. Uh, a little bit later on, um, I had, I was a little bit unfortunate, I got run over the first time. Uh, at the end of a course, we went out for a bit of a booze up. So the moral of the story is don't try and walk across the road by yourself while you're drunk. First year in hospital is the hardest. But uh, again, uh, that was a good experience. I got to meet new people. I uh, did some courses while I was laid up that, that I wouldn't have uh, had the opportunity to do. Um, and uh, a couple of years later, in 1981, we had the opportunity to go back this time, the whole assault troop from TUCAV went over as a platoon uh, with an infantry company from 57 RAR. So the 1981 trip was again uh, the same sort of briefings. They were toned down a little bit, but they said, you know, there's still a threat. 
Uh, the biggest threat is you people believing there is no threat. Um, there was some great training activities. Uh, again, we had to do things like uh, we did anti-riot training and things like that, and it was a case of, you know, uh, over there the anti-riot training was you line up, you go forward as a group, and, and your sign says disperse or we fire, and, and they were serious about it. Uh, same deal. Uh, this time uh, we still had the bullets in the box and all that kind of stuff. We were still doing the quick reaction force call-outs. This time we did even more. You are getting four or five a night. Um, there was a couple of real instances where people called out, and, uh, but this time it was more people trying to thieve items from the flight lines and things like that. Um, but again, uh, you know, a young soldiers not, not to know whether it's somebody trying to thieve an expensive article or whether it's somebody putting a bomb on a plane. So, you know, the, you then have to go and grab them You've got to go and check all the, the fl planes on the flight line you had to go through. You had to call the RAF guards out and they had to help check for bombs, etc., and all that. Um, so we were doing uh, a, a real-time thing. What used to make everybody cranky was uh, over the period uh, that people were going to Air Base Butterworth in the 70s and, and 80s, up to, up to the late 80s, was a number of... Uh, things happened around the world, various uh, people went off to do various things um, and there was not much recognition given to the soldiers who went to Air Base Butterworth and uh, considering uh, the briefings they were given, the tasks they were asked to do and all the stuff that, that, that I know personally we had to do because I was one of the ones doing it, um, the recognition should have been the same as for the people uh, who went to say, Timor in the, in the stages and uh, guarded the dock and sat on the dock and unloaded the ships, you know. Um, they were probably in less danger than, than we were in Butterworth. Same, same, there was a number of places, you know, like, for instance, the comm centre operators and things like that who sat in a protected building in the middle of a protected air base, protected by the rifle company, um, uh, got medals and money and we got nothing. So again, there were some cranky uh, attitudes between the RAF and, and the, the people who did Air Base Butterworth Rifle Company. But there was still a lot of unrest going on in Malaysia uh, and the rest of Southeast Asia all through that. People forget the fact that there was border conflicts. Uh, Pol Pot and his regime were still going strong. There was the after effects, even five, ten years after Vietnam finished, there were still the after effects of the Vietnam War and all the missions that um, various people did into various countries around Vietnam as well as Vietnam itself. So um, those legacies uh, affected us in our uh, efforts on Air Base Butterworth. So all I can say is hats off to all the soldiers that went through at, in Rifle Base Butterworth, especially through the 70s and 80s. Um, I, uh, I had a long army career. I stayed in for 28 years in the regular army, then I got out and I continued uh, until I reached compulsory retirement age earlier this year. So I did uh, almost 46 years in the army, both regular and reserve. But there was a number of people who were in for relatively short periods of time and their legacy was uh, the Air Base Butterworth and the efforts they put in over there. So I feel sorry that they didn't get the, the recognition that I think they should have. Uh, a lot of the hierarchy have played it down. I think a lot of that has to do with um, uh, what medals and money actually mean in that um, if they recognise these people's efforts and they get the veteran uh, effects then there'll be a, a lot more people who were eligible for uh, veterans cards and things like that, medical uh, assistance and stuff like that as they grow older. And obviously a lot of the people from um, the early 70s and through to the early 80s uh, are now 65 plus, like myself. Um, you know, some of the guys that were 30 or 40 back then when I went through, the platoon sergeants, the, the section corporals, things like that, they're obviously uh, 10 or 15 years older than me. So 
these people probably could do with the medical assistance that would be forthcoming uh, from back then. And they served no less than other people in other areas. So um, back to Air Base Butterworth and Malaysia and all that, later on in life I uh, did a number of things. I went through recruiting, I went to B Squadron 3-4 Cav in Townsall to the ODF, uh, got to shoot Milan anti-tank rockets and all good stuff. So I had a, a reasonably interesting career. Not every day was perfect, but a lot of it was good. Um, when I got out, I stayed with the Army Reserve. We came up here to Darwin in 1993. I had a wife back then and some little kids. Uh, we came to open up uh, Headquarters Norcom when Headquarters Norcom was just starting up. And after that, I went back to the 2nd Cavalry Regiment to do uh, the lab acceptance trials in um, uh, 95. I then went into range and area management and stayed in this area uh, for a number of years. Uh, we uh, developed uh, Kangaroo Flats training area, we developed, uh, we bought Bradshaw, um, we went and reopened Yampy Sound training area and, and got that a bit more use over near Derby. Uh, we developed um, Mount Bundy training area. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Darwin Northern Territory region and elements of these people were still going away during this period to uh, do Air Base Butterworth. Um, later on uh, after a period in reserve where I did some career management and stuff like that, uh, I actually went back and did a year full-time service with 2 Cav in 2009. I was fortunate enough then because I had a senior ranger instructor qualifications and things like that. I got the opportunity to go back to Butterworth one more time uh, with A Squadron 2nd Cavalry Regiment. Uh, that was Rotation RCB 85, so they actually changed the name of it. And we went over. And, and I must admit in uh, 2009, the complexion had changed. It was more a training opportunity. Uh, you were still there in, in case anything happened and, and the RAF families did need protection, but the chance of that was a lot more remote uh, than in the early 70s. I think uh, it is a great opportunity. It is a good vehicle for interaction between the Malays and, and Australia. Um, it does give uh, soldiers an opportunity uh, to get out of Australia and go somewhere where it's not so threatening, as opposed to going to uh, our other trouble spots where Australia has troops. Um, it was, again, a, a great experience. We were doing things like still running up the bloody hill in the middle of Penang, uh, which as a 55-year-old trying to keep up with 19-year-olds uh, makes your eyeballs go a little bit wide. Um, but again, it was great to get back there to see some of the old sites. Some of the places were still the same. Some had changed radically. Uh, our commitment over there had changed. Uh, there, for one thing, there was no more mirages over there falling out of the skies and almost not making it back to the air base. And the things that took off were a lot quieter than mirages too, I might add. Um, so uh, it, it was again a great experience. I think the young soldiers that we took over with us in 2009 uh, got a great deal out of it. Uh, it was a good grounding for them to let them uh, work with uh, soldiers from other countries to actually see it. They uh, used it as a, a vehicle too to take these people to places like Vietnam, to Long Tan, things like that. Um, they, they took the opportunity to uh, get some good trips in for the young soldiers, which was good to see. Um, the uh, squadron commander and the people that went over, that I went over with, um, made quite an effort to make sure these, got as, these guys got as much out of uh, their trip, both training-wise and seeing uh, Southeast Asia as they possibly could under the circumstances. So it was really good. Um, I was proud, uh, once again, to go back and be able to assist. Um, since then, I've stayed in career management. Uh, I've, I've stayed in Darwin. I've since been divorced. Those things happen. Um, I've really enjoyed staying in Darwin. I reckon I'll be here till I die. Um, bit sad, I had to eventually get so old that the Army didn't want me anymore. Uh, had the opportunity to be the RSM of the Cadet Battalion, 
um, and also uh, get out and uh, uh, see uh, a bit more of, of the NT through various things. I think I'll go on now that I've um, retired from uh, military service and I'll continue to assist as a cadet officer with the cadet battalion. <coughs> and all I can say is, hey, it's great to be almost a Darwinian. I've been here nearly long enough now to be considered a local um, and, and I think it's great. Uh, I was out on an exercise, this was out back at Cobar um, and uh, we are down near one of the rivers. Um, we were acting as enemy, the, the second cavalry, the squadron I was with was, was enemy. Uh, we had a, a light patrol of just a few assault troopers out running around and um, one of the elements that came up against us was tanks. So with tanks and that, as they come rumbling through, you tend to stand up against a tree, big tree, so they can't run over you. Because if you lie down, they run over you, it really hurts. And uh, I did that uh, behind the tree. Normal tank troopers, three vehicles. So three vehicles went past. I'm there, come on guys, let's go. Didn't realise that I had a fourth vehicle with them. One of the engineer, the Ramey element vehicle was there. So I jumped out. Fortunately, um, they were straddling high, hard ground, and I jumped out on a bit of a, a road, a, a, a track which had soft sand. And I actually got bowled over and, and rolled. I didn't have any backpack or anything on me, so I was relatively clean skin. So I got some bruising and, and a terrible shock. Fortunately, they were going slow. Just rolled over the top of me. All the guys came over when they saw I was all right except for massive bruising, etc. Uh, they all had a good laugh, picked me up and we ran away and hid to play enemy another day. But um, yes, so now when i about to jump out from behind a tree, I actually look around to see what's coming. So these little things happen. And later on when I was doing range management, you know, I was up there in uh, Mount Bundy and they had some big fires going through. and. Um, one of the Mack truck elements that went up. So they came up and knocked me down and parked on top of me. Uh, so again, you know, I'm just unlucky with cars and things, I think. So I'm one of those people now that looks left and right, left and right. Obviously, I had a long career. I was more or a class one when, when I finished my career. Uh, so I held all the ranks. Lance Corporal, up and down a couple of times. Corporal, Sergeant, more or a class two, more or a class one. RSM's appointment. So all, all those sort of things gives me some fairly strong views. Now back when we, we were training, uh, especially as a young soldier, doing conventional warfare training, things like that, you were often put in scenarios where, uh, especially as something like a cavalry regiment, um, you, know, you are one to two days march ahead of the army. You have no support. They cannot get a helicopter to you. They cannot support you with artillery. Uh, you're going to have to travel a long way and be re replenned by your own elements who are going to have to travel forward of the front line of the army. If you get caught and get in a firefight, you are on your own. If you get caught and you're in a firefight and you capture a pile of people, we only want sergeants, warrant officers and officers. So you work out how to get rid of the rest. Now that was how people trained back then. You know, it was a, a, a fact of war. Conventional warfare theory still was based on what happened in World War II, Korea, uh, and then Vietnam. Um, people were very hard nosed about it and said, look, you know, like the, the reality is if you've got 30 people and there's half the enemy army on the other side of the hill, you have to decide for yourself whether you want to let these 20 people go to run back and pick their guns up and start shooting at you again or, or what you want to do. But you can't afford to take them with you. You are not to take them with you. Now that legacy from the training in the 70s and early 80s has obviously kept going and most people would feel that when you're in a firefight, and, and you know one of the things I, I read was you know, a guy goes, uh, there's a guy with an AK-47 shooting out of the doorway at me. 
So I lobbed in a couple of grenades to try and get rid of him. Now, the fact of the matter was, there could have been other people in the house. But me, uh, with my background, I tend to feel those people did the right thing in that it's better for half a dozen uh, of the enemy's mothers to be crying at night rather than one or two Australian mothers. You know, these guys were fellow Australian soldiers. They had family, they had uh, mothers, brothers, fathers, wives, sons, daughters. You know, I, I would much rather the people over there are crying uh, than Australian folk are crying. You know, it's, it's a hard way to look at it, but it's a case of rather them than us. I don't condone um, outright cruelty for, for no value. Uh, I don't condone torture for the sake of just being cruel to somebody. I think that's uh, a load of bullshit. Real soldiers don't do that sort of thing. Real soldiers actually have uh, a reasonable expect, uh, uh, respect for other soldiers. And, and you've got to remember that politicians start wars, soldiers don't start wars, soldiers get sent to fight the wars. And um, especially uh, in conventional warfare and things like that, it, it's not so bad. But in the elements of that kind of warfare where you don't know what the enemy is, the enemy's not wearing a uniform, uh, the girl pushing the bike down the road, bike could be a bomb rather than just transport, uh, you don't know whether the woman with that thing wrapped in her arms that looks like a baby, you don't know whether that's a baby or it's a bomb. Um, you know, you've got to sit there and say you've got to weigh up the pros and cons. And these guys, uh, in a lot of cases, have a very hard time. Now, if in fact there was somebody who was just innately cruel for cruelty's sake or just shot somebody for the sake of shooting somebody, that's not condoned, that's not a soldierly thing, that the people I know and that I train, we're not trained to do anything like that. However, um, you've got to remember it is a hard and fast thing and it's a case of shoot first and, and make sure you don't get shot back. Okay? If that happens, um, it's no good then saying, oh, um, goodness, maybe there were some people in the, the houses behind and your bullets could have gone through the houses. Any chance you could have just asked the bloke not to shoot at you? No. That's crap. Yeah. The Australian public in general, not the whingers and moaners, um, is pretty reasonable. They would understand that things happen in, in violent conflict. Um, a lot of th the time you wouldn't want it to happen. Uh, there will be some collateral damage in, in that, you know, uh, if this bloke's family is sitting behind him while he's shooting the AK-47 at you and, and you throw a grenade in, they're likely to die along with him. And, and that's uh, a part of violent conflict, you know. It's not something you applaud, but it does happen. And people realise that's going to happen. It's no good pontificating about it if you weren't there. You know, if you're the man on the ground, you're the one that you and your mates are under threat, um, and you take that threat out, uh, good luck to you, and make sure that every Australian possible comes home alive and intact. Um, that's the way I look at it. Now, if uh, in amongst all of that uh, there was an instance of torture or um, stupidity or murder, uh, not that I'm saying there was, I've seen none of these proofs and that that they reckon they have, um, I would think that's very rare. I certainly wouldn't tar the entire contingent from that period with the same brush. Uh, it's a case of if there was a person who did do something completely inappropriate and um, all that, yes, you can take his uh, unit citation off him or whatever, but you certainly don't uh, cut the head off every man in your squad because one bloke stole your lolly money. You know, it's, it's just silly. The Malaysian emergency and the follow-up, uh, the existence of... Airbase Butterworth and the rifle company Butterworth that rotated through it for all those years is actually quite interesting. There is historical stuff around that you can go and read and find out about it. It's just not well put forward. It's one of those things that are strangely overlooked uh, by 
government, by historians and everything like that. There, there's a few books written by people who are up there. Um, and uh, I did read one of these about the original Malaysian emergency and uh, that, that was frightening, frightening stuff. And it's hardly ever brought out. It's not even well recorded in our, uh, at the War Memorial and that. There is a bit of stuff there about it, um, but I think there could be more. Um, there was enormous problems when on in Southeast Asia for years, and they were overshadowed, as I said, by Vietnam itself and the other uh, conflicts we went to. But, you know, there, there was terrible troubles up there for the, those Asian countries and Malaysia, Thailand, and, and all that area there, uh, where the Australian contingent was near. And people don't realise the, the length and breadth of the troubles that were there because they were overshadowed by other things that were better reported. Um, but there is a lot of historical material there. You can go and dig it out and, and research it. Um, there are now books recording who went to Malaysia as part of the rifle, Butter, uh, rifle base Butterworth, uh, the rifle company Butterworth, I should say, contingents. You know, they, they've got all their names down now and things like that. They've got record, better records now of uh, the people that went to the first emergency and all that and, and what happened. Um, but the, these are sort of slow to be put together and, and they're not well pushed as part of our history. Um, but they were certainly uh, a part of our, the Australian history and part of our, our military history as well. Uh, just not that well reported. But again, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, our efforts in the Korean War and the Army of Occupation of Japan and, and all those sort of things were poorly recorded and poorly put forward as part of our history as well. Because after the big conflict, after World War II, they went, ah, everybody breathed a sigh of relief. So they forgot that there was still a heap, great heap of people over there, um, some of them having problems. Uh, then Korea came along and initially nobody wanted to know about it. Initially nobody wanted it to happen. Then it did happen. And people don't realise the, the size of the commitment we did and the, the terrible fighting that went on and things like that because it's not put up like the history of World War II is, like the history of Vietnam is. It was that in-between period where, yes, they did have cameras, but again, it wasn't well pushed forward to the Australian public. Um, and it's a pity, you know. Uh, all, all that middle area conflict between um, World War II and uh, Vietnam, poorly recorded, poorly put forward as history, and then anything that happened while Vietnam was on and just after Vietnam, poorly recorded, poorly pushed forward because the government really didn't want to know about it. Um, and then only later on when we actually had major commitments uh, in, you know, over in uh, the desert and things like that, that these sort of things came up. You know, uh, Timor, the original effort in Timor, poorly recorded, poorly put forward. Uh, people didn't realise just how quickly and well Australia reacted to, to Timor. Um, how we were streets ahead of anybody else initially and then when we allowed, or, or we didn't allow, but then when the UN did come on board and manage it afterwards, how poorly it was managed and how the Australian government just caved in and, and let that poor management um, ruin a lot of the good work that Australia had done in Timor. You know, all those sort of things, you know, again, they're poorly recorded, uh, they're not pushed in our schools very well, um, you know, as part of our history. Uh, a lot of the times, I think, uh, other stuff that, that is uh, much less important uh, seems to come up, you know. People always laugh about the crocodile stories. You know, we get a picture of a crocodile on the front page of the NT newspaper at least once or twice a week. You know, but there's, there's stories uh, of much more import that are buried on page seven or page 10. And you're sort of going, how, how do we get a picture of a crocodile instead of this story about what's going on in bloody uh, Saudi Arabia or Kuwait? You know, Kuwait's on page seven, crocodile pictures on page one. So, you know, that's been uh, the problem. And, and indeed, that, that goes around Australia. You know, um, people are much more interested in what their neighbor said or did or what, you know, uh, the Queen Mother's wearing or something like that, or, or you know, um, 
you know, than the real stories, and that's just an unfortunate fact of life. Uh, in closing, uh, what I would like to say is um, the military can be a great life. It is still a good long-term career. It's still a good short-term career. Um, both my sons wound up joining the Army. Uh, they've since got out. One's gone into the RAF, one's gone into the Navy. He wants to be a marine technician and live in submarines. I don't actually see the fun in that, but you know, I'm quite proud of both my sons. Um, so that's Connor McDade and Lachlan McDade. Shout out to you two. And um, all I can say is I think Darwin's a great place to be. I'm glad I, I spent some time in the Army. And uh, the legacy of Air Base Butterworth uh, should live on. And people should recognise the fact that uh, from the first Malaysian emergency right through to the late 80s, there was a threat over there. Australia did have commitments over there. Um, all sorts of things went on over there that uh, were secret or a bit squeaky or people that didn't realise because Vietnam overshadowed it and since Vietnam other, other uh, places we've served have over, overshadowed uh, the actual commitment uh, from the soldiers who've gone to Southeast Asia with their base Butterworth rotations. Um, the rifle company Butterworth I think uh, was a great thing. Um, I'm glad the Australian Government went through with it. It's just a pity the Australian Government and our current leaders and that uh, are not more willing to recognise the service that all those soldiers um, actually gave in, in going there. Um, they were putting their lives on their line um, because if you go there and you actually believe there's a threat, um, you can be just as scared um, as if there was no threat at all. And back then, um, there was a credible threat. Um, it didn't eventuate, fortunately. Um, nobody wants to uh, see your mates uh, actually in a conflict or, or getting hurt or killed. So we were all always happy, touch wood, uh, that nothing happened to us. Um, but that was more by good luck uh, than sound planning.